There are a lot of metal detail parts on this model, and it is incredibly nicely done. Hi there T, it is great to see you, I hope I find you well. I'm Jennifer Kerr, welcoming you up here to the Loft on Weir Yard, and today we're going to be taking a look at what I believe to be a little bit of a hidden gem that's available in model shops up and down the country, and seems to have been a little bit overshadowed by subsequent releases that have taken all the limelight. Nonetheless, I've found this model out there for some really good prices and available in a range of different liveries. I'd like to thank Oxford Rail, who sent over this model for review, and we're going to be looking at the Dean Goods class locomotive. This came out with a big fanfare as the initial release from Oxford Rail, and I want to take a good close look at this and see is this the model that you should really be considering getting for the value for money that it potentially offers. Well, come with me in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Extra support for this video is provided by PD Models, makers of some amazing 3D printed kits in both N-Gage and Double O. We will also be doing a full DCC fit if you want to stay tuned for later on in the video, and we'll be using the Trainomatic 8 pin decoder for this. Without further ado, let's take a look at today's review model. This is the subject of today's video and I'd like to thank Oxford Rail for very, very generously sending this over for review. It's one of their Dean Goods locomotives. They've been out for some time now, but it's something that I spotted that uh, quite a lot of shops are still having these in stock in a number of different liveries. And I guess with the, uh, the strides in new model releases, it's easy to overlook some of the models that have been around for a while, but they do offer some great value for money. So it's a really great opportunity to take a look at a model that's quite easy to come by at the moment in a number of the different liveries. And we do have some links in the description box down below just to help you out to take you to where you can find some of these models at a really great price. Now I'm just going to show you the code on the end of the box there. This particular example is OR76DG003 and this is number 2475, the Dean Goods in its unlined GWR livery. Now the genesis of these locomotives really goes back to 1877 and that's when Dean took over as the chief locomotive superintendent at the Great Western Railway after the untimely death of his boss Armstrong. And uh, Dean was a GWR man through and through. He'd been there since the age of 15. And now um, whilst there uh, under the supervision of Armstrong, he'd um, seen the slow conversion of broad gauge to standard gauge and it has to be said that um, the Great Western Railway had took a lot of stock in building 060 tank locomotives as part of the locomotive uh, renewals program but he recognized that they needed something a little bit bigger with longer range and in 1883 the first of the Dean Goods class 2301 began to appear as the first batch of uh, these very successful and long-lived locomotives. Now they weren't all cookie cutter representations of each other there was a lot of differences between different batches of them. Uh, the first 20 were with domeless boilers, there were some with bell pair fireboxes, um, a variety of other mechanical and detail differences, and perhaps the biggest was that there was a batch built with outside frames as well, uh, which probably seems quite strange now, but at the time actually that was more the norm of what the Great Western Railway had tended to produce, and it was these locomotives that very much departed from that. They were very, very successful and dependable 
and uh, they were actually seconded during a time of war towards the end of the First World War in 1917. 62 of the class were obtained by the Rail Operating Division to work in France. And in 1918, 14 of these 62 were sent to Salonika, uh, and actually eight of these managed to survive and be returned to the UK. There were also a number that passed to the Ottoman Railways, and I believe that at least one of those lasted right through into the 1950s. Um, when the Second World War rolled around again, they were called upon again to go to the front to work in uh, occupied Europe. A number were destroyed in the process, um, but they got far and wide. Some of them were captured by the Germans, made their way into the German rail system used there. Uh, Austria had some, Russia, uh, three managed to get there. In fact, one of those three was eventually repatriated. Uh, a number were actually sold on to China. It's an interesting fact that uh, a number of locomotive classes did make their way over to China. The uh, Robinson 8K, the Stanier 8F, just to name two others as well. And it would be interesting to know the full fate of those that went to China. I'm expecting that they um, were scrapped and are long gone, but it would be interesting to find out whether there is at least one of these languishing somewhere rusting away in China. Now the Oxford Rail model was their very first release locomotive wise when that mark exploded onto the model scene. And it's a model which has been in the catalogue of another manufacturer all the way back to the 1970s, going through iterations of tender drive. This particular model, however, owes absolutely nothing to that somewhat toy-like model that had been in existence. Long overdue for a all-new model, it was Oxford Rail that chose to deliver it. And this was the model that was the result. In some respects, one of the main criteria for Oxford Rail was keeping the price down. We'd seen some massive inflation in model prices, and what Oxford Rail really did manage to do very successfully was shake things up in conjunction with the fact that they owned their own manufacturing plant out in China, they were able to control the costs far, far better. Now, there were a few compromises made on the model, but the end result was a uh, locomotive that was tooled to modern standards that was actually reaching the market at a price point that was significantly lower than anything we'd come to expect from the other major manufacturers. Out of the box, uh, one of the things that we do get is a few extra detailed parts. So uh, let's just have a look in this bag. We've got the brake rigging, uh, we've got a front coupling, and then we've got an assortment of buffer beam detail there just for the front buffer beam. And really it's an either or with that for the front coupling. So I'm just going to put that back in there. First impressions of the locomotive are good. It has a reasonable weight and the overall look of the model really does capture that large dome which actually towers above the cab roof um, that was so characteristic of this class of locomotive. The front face as well, we've got that uh, dished smoke box door that sort of sits a little bit high so we get a slightly elongated shape towards the bottom. And the flap there which covers the fronts of the cylinders is uh, reproduced actually really quite nicely. We've got some sanding boxes here on the running plate. They really look good and uh, there's quite a wealth of rivet detail around that smoke box. This model does represent the locomotive towards the end of its years. And whilst there is one preserved example in the National Railway collection, uh, one of the things that I've noticed when I've been studying photographs online is that there is a lot of detailed differences between different members of the same class. Now, I'm going to hold this here because one of the things uh, that did attract some degree of criticism was the shape of the firebox. Now, I've been scrutinising photographs that I found on the internet, just trying to see 
what, if anything, is um, not uh, quite right on this. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really struggling. Now, I've got a photograph that I've uh, just got a, a screen grab of, and it shows this area of the model. And whilst it doesn't have the prominent banding that this particular model does, what I did see between that and other photographs uh, is that this area in particular of the prototype does seem to have been bashed around and changed a little bit throughout the locomotive's lives. And I wasn't convinced that there was any difficulties or problems with what we were seeing on this firebox. And actually you can see it's a very complex shape and this matches with the complex shapes seen in the photographs of the locomotive. And it's always really difficult with the light and the shadows, with the natural weathering, with dirt on the real locomotives, to really get a 100% uh, comparison. Of course, you could go to see the preserved example. But again, as I said before, what I spotted was that there's a lot of discrepancies between different members of this class. And with such a long lifespan, with uh, a number of different batches having been built, with new boilers being uh, built, with repairs being carried out, um, they just end up with quirky little differences. So I'm inclined to say that actually there's nothing about that firebox that really bothers me at all. I know some people did compare it to the older model, but I'm not convinced that the older model uh, from another manufacturer is any more accurate. It merely depicts a different state of the locomotive, which is in keeping with the different prototype pictures that I've been looking at online. So I'm not really convinced that there's anything wrong there at all. But I thought it was best to focus on that because that was an area that did get a lot of comment when these first came out. One of the other areas as well where I noted that um, perhaps costs have been kept down is that there's nothing to be seen underneath the boiler. We do get that air gap all the way through, but there's no suggestion of the motion inside there. So it is something that is quite subtle, but it does add something to uh, locomotives that do have the representation of the inside motion. It's not a deal breaker on this, um, but it is, again, something just for me to point out. The handrails are all metal, really nicely done and finished, and actually really quite robust, always good to see. The reversing lever is a separately applied part picked out in the gunmetally silver. The running plate um, feels good and firm. There's no bowing that I can see to it. And underneath that running plate, we've got uh, really nice wheels. I, I do like the finish that Oxford Rail has got on these with the slightly, slightly matte, um, a little bit edge of satin, almost like a gunmetal finish. And the connecting rods really are nice and fine. Spokes on the wheels too do really look the part. And the uh, counterweights in the centre wheels are in the right places. And these are not just cookie cutter um, duplicates of each other. The other wheels are accurate uh, for the, the balance weights as per the prototype. It also comes with the brake rigging factory attached, um, which actually does add quite a lot on this model because it is outside the wheels rather than inside. So it is something that really does look good. On the front buffer beam, we've got the vacuum stanchion and the front coupling hook do come as standard fitted. Um, it doesn't actually look like there's anything that really needs to be uh, fitted as extra on there. I'm just looking. And I have a feeling, actually, yes, the extra detail parts that come in the bag here, I think they're for the back buffer beam, but we do get the vacuum stanchion is um, all fitted, as is the coupling hook. So actually, um, to me, this actually looks really, really good. 
The standard of the printing is really, really nice, and I've got every faith that under close magnification that is going to look absolutely superb. The lettering on the side with the drop shadowing is really nicely done. Those letters really do uh, look like they pop out. But yeah, you can see there, really sharp, absolutely sharp. And the rivet detail below the uh, running plate is so nicely done. In fact, actually, the chassis on this tender really does have a lot to give. And the black paint finish is really really nice they've got the shade of black just right it's got that effect that makes it look like painted metal really really does jump out really well you can see that the running plate of the locomotive itself is very very solid these steps have the correct curved uh, look that uh, the prototype has and i think it's metal for the for the adhesive weight but it's certainly is really nice and robust. These uh, front steps, again, they feel like they're metal. There are a lot of metal detail parts on this model and it is incredibly nicely done. Looking to the other side, um, again, it's really nice and I can forgive there not being any representation of the motion under the boiler because actually from most viewing distances you're just not going to see it. Looking into the cab and you can see the detail there, those dials, really really nice. All of the pipework is picked out and we've got flush glazing in those uh, those portholes. Incredibly well done. Flush inside the cab, flush outside the cab. That is actually really well done and there's no prismatic effect around the edges. It is flat as it should be. There's lots of detail picked out in the cab. I do like that reversing lever. That does look good. And then if we look to the front side of the tender, we've got the brake stanchions. We've got the fire iron rest. Some toolboxes. Again, there's a lot going on here. And let's just see... Uh, just trying to see whether the coal load comes out. I'm not sure if it does or not. There doesn't seem to be any movement on it, um, but certainly the representation of that coal does look pretty acceptable. On the back there, we've got the uh, uh, water filler and uh, really the entirety of the tender and the locomotive does seem to have been captured really, really well. Full plate between locomotive and tender is fully poseable, which means that you can push it all the way down flat. And that really does make a difference. It does actually fill the gap. So um, I really do like that. That's something that can often be a bit of an issue on some locomotives, but not on this one. Buffers fully sprung. They're good and firm. And actually the spring on these buffers is good. They're not uh, showing any risk of sticking inside the shanks. Same with those on the rear of the tender. Coupling is a slimline tension lock. So we can just see there in a NEM pocket. There is a NEM pocket uh, on the front of the locomotive. You can actually take that out if you want to remove that entirely. And then uh, as you can see underneath, we have got uh, pickups to all six drive wheels and there does appear to be pickups there on the tender wheels as well. So I'm expecting good things from the performance of this model. Whistles on the cab roof appear to be turned metal. So actually there is a lot of value added extra quality bits and pieces on this. And the closer you look, the more there is to be impressed with. And for the price, I am very, very impressed. Out of the box, the performance of this locomotive on my DC test track was absolutely fine. Now they do normally recommend that you run these locomotives in for around half an hour forwards and backwards. But actually, out of the box, there was no issues. It was a fairly smooth running mechanism. There was no growling of the gears. And it seemed equally happy going forwards as it did in reverse. 
When it comes to DCC, the locomotive is offered by Oxford Rail with sound fitted versions available and these appear to use an ESU lock sound and really do give a great sound quality. This particular example is a DCC ready example and the 8 pin socket is hidden away in the tender. For DCC fitting, we recommend the Trainomatic 8 pin wired decoder and we've got some links down below to take you to their UK stockist Tram Fabrique where you can pick up this and also the whole rest of the Trainomatic range. For the fitting process all you need is a set of jeweler's screwdrivers and just in case we need it I'm also going to have to hand some captain tape from DCC Concepts which is great for just making sure that wires stay where you want them to and because this is incredibly thin but very strong it is really really good for um, just stopping wires from getting trapped when you put the body back on. So first things first what we're going to do is to carefully pick up the locomotive and tender they are connected to each other by this coupled drawbar and you can see there that it does have a close coupling option and this is a mechanism similar to what Hornby use and it is very very effective. It also means by having the locomotive and tender semi-permanently coupled in this way there's no risk of putting stress on these wires which could damage the plug and cause huge problems further down the line. So that is a really great feature that I do really like. To get into the tender, we just need to loosen off these two screws at the front, just there and there. Make sure you keep these screws safe and the whole tender should really easily just pull free. And you can see that inside the tender, we do have a lot of extra space so there's plenty of room in here for fitting a speaker should you need to and also there's room for a stay alive too with some careful fitting just down the sides of where the coal load is in place. You can see in the back here we've got the characteristic Oxford rail plug that do come with this capacitor on it uh, just fitted into the blanking plate and we just very carefully rock it from side to side and take that free. You can also see the clip here which is for taking the Shuka Cube speaker with the sound installation. See I told you that it's really really easy. So if we go for the Trainomatic 8 pin decoder, let's just uh, pull this free and then what we need to do is we've got a little arrow there for pin 1 that matches up with the orange wire on the plug. Line up the pins gently push home and as we're not going to be doing a sound installation we can just look to uh, just very carefully fit the decoder into place there and what I'm actually going to do is use some of that DCC Concepts captain tape just to make sure that we don't get any movement of that decoder and this is really really strong but very very thin so it doesn't add any extra bulk it also doesn't run the risk of overheating decoders either so we're just going to just fit some of this over the top just just to hold some of that wire in place. Tender top, we've got this hook at the back, you just see it there. Just make sure that goes into the right place and you can feel the tender top goes back down really easily. You don't need to force it, there is a lot of room inside there. And then we just reapply those two screws at the front and there we have it the locomotive is DCC fitted by default that's on address number three 
and uh, we can just quickly take it to the programming track, get that programmed, and let's see how well it runs. This model actually ran really, really well out of the box. I was actually, it has to be said, given that it's not as heavy as some of the more modern locomotives that have come through since, I thought it might struggle on the 5% gradient that Weir Yard has. But actually, it went up that with a short goods train without any sign of wheel slip whatsoever. So it's actually done better than some of the more recent locomotives that we've reviewed. It ran pretty smoothly, actually. There was a quality pickup and slow down using that trainomatic decoder without any need to change any of the CVs, and the back EMF seemed to work just fine. It made its way sure footedly through all of the point work, and it even managed some radius one curves without really complaining in the slightest. So Overall, I'm pretty impressed with the running qualities of this locomotive. And that brings us to the scores. First up is build quality. And in all the time that I've been handling this, there's no real sign of anything falling off. The detail is well attached. The buffers too are really nicely done. And that sublime printing as well seemed very, very inclined to stay put. I really like as well these raised etched style number plates on the side of the locomotive and again these are firmly fixed in place with no sign of them coming adrift. The chimney, the dome and the safety valve bonnet are all well in place and the metal whistles too showed no signs or tendency to breaking off which is something which I know does afflict other locomotives from other manufacturers so it's a really great choice of materials so all in all I've got no hesitation to give this a 9.0 out of 10. On running quality as we've already covered it ran really well out of the box on DC, smoothly running both forwards and reverse with no tight spots and no grinding noise from any of the motor or gear chain. Once it was DCC fitted, again, the grip was really good, showing a locomotive that is really well balanced. The pickups on the tender really do add greatly to the reliability of this model. I hadn't bothered to fit it with a stay alive and quite frankly it showed no signs of needing one either so really pleased with that. It handled the 5% gradients with a short goods train with no sign of wheel slippage so all in all I was pretty happy with what this locomotive could do and I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, I really do like the ease of access to that tender to put in the DCC decoder. It is an older style 8 pin plug, which does mean that you're going to need to find a way of either hiding all of that extra wire or making sure that you have a direct plug decoder that does fit within the space. The space within the tender is quite generous and there is space for a speaker as well for those who want to go down the sound fitting route. One thing I would say though is that when putting the tender top back on it took a couple of goes just to get the screw holes to line up. There's no positive alignment on the tender top and it did feel a little bit easy to get it accidentally out of line but it's not really a huge problem and it was easily solved. So I'm going to give this a 9.1 out of 10. On accuracy and quality of finish, I'm inclined to give this model a great benefit of the doubt. I have studied an awful lot of photographs of the real locomotives and noted that there is a huge amount of minor detail discrepancies between different members of the same class. I could find photographs that really did look pretty close to what Oxford Rail have achieved with this. So whilst people did complain that the firebox didn't to them look right, I think it has to be fair to say that if you compare it to the right member of the class, then it really does look okay to me. Other areas of this locomotive I felt Oxford Rail have captured really well, including importantly that front face. One of the areas that for me was a little bit of a detraction is that lack of any inside motion detail underneath the boiler. It's not a big issue, but 
the fact that it's not there, but we have become quite used to seeing it on other locomotives, is just something that's worth pointing out. I do like the poseable fall plate between the locomotive and tender. That is really nicely done. And that back head detail in the cab is really nicely done. All in all, that goes to give this an 8.0 out of 10. Finally, we come to value for money. And this is another area where Oxford always score really, really well. They produce good, solid, reliable locomotives that capture the prototype well and that have the performance too. So all in all, I'm going to give this an 8.6 out of 10. And that gives us a final score of 45 out of 50, which is really, really respectable. So I'd just like to thank Oxford Rail for sending this locomotive over for review. And as I said at the beginning, there are a number of these locomotives available from a huge number of retailers up and down the country in a number of different livery options. From early lined Great Western with the shiny brass dome, through the Great Western with the painted green dome without the lining. We've also got the rail operating division version, the War Department Black, and British Rail versions too. It can be had in both sound fitted and DCC ready options. And it should be said that the sound fitted version offers exceptional value for money. Certainly it's one of those fittings where you really do wonder how they've managed to get in such a good sound installation at such a low price. It's almost like they give you the locomotive with every sound chip bought. So this locomotive gets the Jenny thumbs up of approval. Well, I hope you found that really informative. Do let me know in the comments section down below. It'd be lovely to hear from you and see what you think about the Oxford Rail Dean Goods locomotive. Do you have one of these locomotives? Do you agree with my assessment? Or is this a model that is now firmly on your radar where before maybe it wasn't? I'd love to hear from all of you and I do read all of the comments. Please tickle that like button, share this video too, and subscribe to the channel to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. And we've also got some links in the description box down below to help you find your own Dean Goods models. So grab one now because they're sure to sell out quickly at the amazing price that I've been able to find them at up and down the country in a whole host of different model shops. Don't forget that you can also head on over to Patreon at the link in the description box and help us to keep making the videos that you want to see. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take great care of yourself. Take care, bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Today's video also comes with the support of PD Models, makers of a whole range of 3D printed kits and accessory detailing that brings something special to your model layout. Available in a number of different scales and gauges, this range is sure to have something for you. So check them out at the affiliate link down below to see what they have got today to make your model layout something special. PD models are also well known for their museum quality models that can be made bespoke to order. So do contact them if you have some specific requirements and see if they can do something special for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYMRish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Graham Foster, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 Class, Ian Coulson, and Alan Dickerson.
Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.